The passage I'm going to be preaching on is the psalm, Psalm 139, and particularly the verse, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. A minister was being entertained at dinner, and the other guests were praising his sermon one after the other. And one of the hosts turned to his son, who was at the table, and asked, what did you think of the sermon? And the young boy said, it was okay, except he passed up three real good places where he could have stopped. <laughs> I entitled today's sermon, Defeating Despair, and I did this so that everyone would be able to identify with the topic and not just pastors who hope to never hear such a comment after their sermon. Despair is a part of all of our lives from time to time. There are times when all of us face what we what have been called the three back black days of despair. These three black days include feelings of worthlessness, worthlessness, feelings of failure, and the sense that many get of being washed up or over the hill. Now, while all of us, is, this is certainly applicable to each of us here, there's a group of people that these feelings affect perhaps more on an everyday basis. And so while I have to say is uh, hopefully can be used by anyone, I particularly want to address my message to those who have been around the block a time or two. I'm talking about our more senior citizens. Those of you who have reached or are about to reach or who have long passed the age of retirement. I want to specifically talk to you because you are perhaps more susceptible to these dark days of despair. And the reason you are more susceptible probably has to do with the joys of getting older and what joys they are, right? I bet that every one of us here older than 40 can vouch for the fact that the old gray mare isn't what she used to be. I know this is certainly true for me. I'm reminded of the older woman who was filling out an application for housing in a retirement home. She was a bit nervous answering all the questions about her health, fearing she might be refused admission. But she finally finished the form, signed her name, and then filled in the place where it asked for her current address. After zip, she printed slowly but firmly, normal for my age. Getting older has some rather obvious disadvantages. It was Casey Stengel who once said, I was fired because of my age and I'll never make the mistake of being 70 again. <laughs> but what's the alternative? The truth is that you know you're getting old when almost everything hurts and when what doesn't hurt doesn't work anymore. You know you're getting older when it feels like the morning after the night before and you haven't been anywhere. You know old age is caught up to you when all the names in your little address book end in MD or when, you're getting, or when you get winded playing checkers or chess. You know you're not a young whippersnapper anymore when you actually look forward to a dull evening and when you turn out the lights for economic and not romantic reasons. You know your body is just a tad older when you sink your teeth into a steak and they stay there. <laughs> or ladies, when you try to strengthen, straighten the wrinkles in your hose and you find out you aren't wearing any. <laughs> it would be great if we could grow older without all the side effects and complications, but we can't. Time takes its toll on all of us. In a conversation with Woody Allen, Groucho Marx said he was often asked what pe he'd like people saying about him in a hundred years. And Woody responded, I know what I'd like them to say about me. I'd like them to say he looks good for his age. But jokes aside, there's a lot about getting older that isn't any fun or funny at all. And perhaps because of this, older folks, perhaps more than others, are confronted with a growing sense of despair. I think that this is a state of the psalmist who penned Psalm 139. The person who wrote this psalm was not a youth, he was not a young adult, and was probably well past middle age. 
The psalmist of this passage knows all about the three black days of despair. He's lived through them, experienced them, and has learned how to overcome each of them. And he shares his knowledge with us in this passage. First of all, the psalmist gives a remedy to the feelings of worthlessness that we all have from time to time. Feelings that we are not as good as other people, that we are unworthy of love, that no one would ever want to be with us, that our flaws and faults are all too apparent, while our good qualities are hard to see. Feelings of unworthiness are not uncommon, and none of us have such a high self-esteem that we can overcome these feelings all by ourselves. But we don't have to. In fact, the best way to combat the feelings of worthiness is the, with the graciousness of God. In, the, in six verses, the psalmist states that God knows him, that God knows all about him, and that in spite of what God knows, God still loves him. He writes, O Lord, you have examined me and know me. When I sit down or stand up, you know it. You discern my thoughts from afar. You observe my walking and reclining and are familiar with all my ways. There is not a word on my tongue, but that you, O Lord, know it well. And yet you are a hedge before and behind. You lay your hand upon me. It is beyond my knowledge. It is a mystery I cannot understand. It is indeed a mystery that the God who knows us, knows us better than anyone, who knows all of our faults and failings, this God still loves us and cares for us. All of our feelings of unworthiness should fade away in the presence of God's graciousness. Too often we let the opinions of others tell us who we are, but the only one who should do this, the only one who can tell us who we are is God. And God loves and cares for us as we are. We are people of worth. The second aspect of despair that the psalmist battles is related to the first. Our feelings of unworthiness often are tied with the feel of fear of failure. Now this is a fear that all of us, I think, have experienced as well. Who among us has not stepped out in faith at times? Who hasn't held back and not dared to do something that seemed difficult? Who hasn't at times taken or not taken a risk because of a fear of failing? No doubt everybody here has, at one time or another, been par paralyzed by fear. But again, this doesn't have to be the case. For one thing, each and every one of us have failed many times, even though we may not remember them. I'm sure that I fell down the first time I tried to walk, and I bet you did too. He probably almost drowned the first time he tried to swim, just like me. And I doubt that anyone here hit the ball as a home run the first time they picked up a bat and swung it at an incoming pitch. Did you know that Macy opened and closed six stores in New York City, all of them huge flops before he succeeded on his seventh try? English novelist John Creasy received 753 rejection slips in the mail before he published the first of his 564 books. Babe Ruth hit 714 home runs during his career, but did you know that he also struck out 1,330 times? Failure is a part of life, and though all of us have failed from time to time, we have survived. Instead of worrying about and fearing, fearing failure, we should consider the many opportunities we miss when we don't try for fear of failing. The story is told of an important football game between two teams. One team was much larger than the other and it was dominating the game, thoroughly beating the smaller team, but the score was still close. The coach from the smaller team realized that his players were not able to contain or block the opposition. His only hope was to call plays that would go to Calhoun the fastest back in the area, who could easily outrun the larger players if he broke free. The coach talked to the quarterback about giving the ball to Calhoun, letting him run with it. The first play, the call was, ex the coach was excited, but Calhoun did not get the ball. 
The second play was also a signal for Calhoun, but once again, he did not get the ball. Now the game was entering its final moments, and the, other, and the team's only hope was for Calhoun to break free and score the winning touchdown. The third play, and again, Calhoun did not get the ball. The coach was upset, so he sent him to play again for the fourth and final play. The ball was snapped, the quarterback was sacked, and the game came to an end. The coach was furious. He confronted the quarterback. I told you four times to give the ball to Calhoun, and now we've lost the game. The quarterback stood his ground as he replied, four times I called the play to give the ball to Calhoun. The problem was that Calhoun did not want the ball. Calhoun's problem was fear. He was maybe afraid of the opposing team, but I think even more he was afraid of failing. But in fact, it is during our times of great failure that God is often hardest at work in our lives. Chuck Colson, who spent time in prison for his role in Watergate, also began a lasting and meaningful relationship with Christ because of his experience behind bars. And the ironic thing about this is that if he had not been convicted and sentenced to jail time, he probably would have never found Christ and he wouldn't be the witness for the Christian faith that he became. He writes about this in his book, Loving God. He says, the real legacy of my life was my biggest failure, that I was an ex-convict, my greatest humiliation being sent to prison was the beginning of God's greatest use of my life. God chose the one experience in which I could not glory for his glory. What Colson is talking about is the providence of God, the continuing love and care that God has for each of us, regardless of who we are or what we have done. God is at work in the worst that we can do and God will always be there for us. This is what the psalmist affirms when he says, where can I escape from you, spirit, your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I descend to Sheol, you are there too. If I take the wing with the dawn to come to rest on the western horizon, even there your hand will be guiding me, your right hand will be holding me fast. And if I say, surely darkness will conceal me, night will provide me with cover, darkness is not dark for you. Night is as light as day, darkness and light are the same. In other words, you can't shake God. No matter what you do, no matter where you go, no matter what happens to you, the providence of God is there, intimate, so there is nothing for us to fear. In 1873, Horatio Spafford, a Christian lawyer from Chicago, placed his wife and four children on a luxury liner sailing from New York to France. Spafford hoped to join them in about three or four weeks after finishing up some business. But with the exception of his wife, he never saw his family again. The voyage started out well, but on the evening of November 21st, as the ship made its way across the ocean, it was struck by another vessel. Within 30 minutes, the luxury liner had sunk and nearly everyone on board was lost. Upon being told the ship was sinking, Mrs. Spafford knelt with her children to pray. And a few minutes later in the ensuing confusion, three of the children were swept away by waves, leaving only the youngest child in her arms. But in just a few short minutes, he too was wrenched away by the waves. Miss Spafford became unconscious, and when she awoke, she discovered that she had been rescued by sailors from the other ship. Her four children, however, were gone. Back in the United States, Horatio Spafford waited for news about his family, and at last, 10 days later, when the rescue ship had reached England, it came. His wife's message was two words in length, saved alone. That night, Spafford walked the floors of his home in anguish as anyone would have done. But this was not all he did. He also shared his loss with God in prayer 
and in so doing found a peace that passes our understanding. Toward morning he told a friend of his, I am glad to be able to trust my Lord when it cost me something. And he did trust God. For some time later, as he reflected upon the disaster at sea, Spafford penned the words to the great hymn of faith, his faith. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Horshell Spafford realized that he had nothing to fear. The psalmist also knew this, and it's time for us to affirm the truth as well. There is nothing for us to fear, not even failure. And this brings me to the third area of despair, an area especially common to those who have been around for a while. I'm talking about the feeling of being washed up or over the hill. You hear, you've heard people give voice to this despair when they say things like, it's all down here from here. I've nothing to look forward to anymore. There's nothing left for me to do. Life has lost its meaning, or I'm too old, what can I do? We often joke about someone being over the hill when they celebrate a birthday, but that attitude has grave consequences, for it can paralyze a person just as surely as the fear of failure. And the way to combat a feeling of being washed up is to turn the hope to our hope in God and what God has, is, and will do. Our lives are productive. We can accomplish great things from birth to death because God is intricately involved in our lives from their beginning to their end. As the psalmist says, you fashioned me in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am beautifully and wonderfully made. Your work is wonderful. I know it well. In other words, God doesn't make any junk, of course. And we are, each of us, part of God's awesome and wonderful creation. And as long as God's Spirit is with us, we cannot be washed up. We cannot be over the hill. As long as God is with us, there's no reason to despair. Because God's grace, God's providence, and the hope I have in God can and will sustain me. They'll help me and you to overcome and defeat despair in any of its forms. I am a person of worth because God loves me. I can move beyond my fears because God is with me. And I can overcome feelings I have that the best of life has passed me by when I realize that God is still a part of my life today and that God is still working in me. Let us celebrate the defeat of despair by remembering that through Christ we have the victory. For it is Christ who shows us God's love on the cross. It is Christ's presence that we celebrate every time we take communion in the elements of bread and wine. And it is Christ's body and blood that will sustain us throughout our lives, giving us the nourishment and the hope we need to overcome. The victory is ours to claim. We can defeat despair and live as we were meant to live. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory in Christ Jesus. Amen.